Welcome back to another episode of Excuse My Grandma. It's Kim and my co-host. Grandma Gail. We've been very busy with all of our Excuse My Grandma stuff. Recently, we have a lot of exciting business things coming up for us, so I'm excited for you all to see. I hope you guys tuned into our live stream of the Oscars red carpet on Sunday and enjoyed that. Also, if you guys liked our Oscars coverage... We can do some stuff on more television episodes and go live and give our feedback. If you guys want our opinions on specific TV shows, DM me on Instagram and let us know. And of course, you know that Kimmy entered us into a contest and we won the userin contest. So now we have a year's supply of userin. So anybody out in the audience who needs some userin, you can always contact us. (laughs) We'll send you some. (laughs) This week, we are talking about more of a serious topic actually it's very topical right now correct if you guys don't know there was like a parental rights and education bill um being discussed in florida or no it was passed in florida actually kim this uh, this past week i think and it's people are calling it the don't say gay bill and essentially it's um it's forbidding discussions of sexual orientation and gender identity in classrooms before um, the fourth uh, uh, before the fourth grade it, uh, after the fourth grade they can do it but they don't want young children to ha- be influenced by any conversations by the s- teachers uh, they want to leave it up to parents at that point right our guest this week liz goldwin she's the creator of the sex ed which is a multimedia platform for educational resources for really anybody just to learn more about sexuality and gender identity so it's another way to learn outside of the classroom we hope that this episode can be informative we are joined by liz goldwin she's the creator of the sex ed which is a multimedia platform for educational resources including the sex ed podcast and website articles and speakers. We'll get into all of that. But Liz, thanks for joining us. Thank you, Liz, for having me. You said you've been in this industry for a long time. How did that come about? Um, Well, my first job was at Planned Parenthood when I was 13. I worked in the clinic in Santa Monica. And I had, my mother is super feminist, um, took me to my first pro-choice rally when I was like nine years old gave me like a lot of literature to read when I was a kid, Simone de Beauvoir and Colette. And my dad, on the other hand, he was like a total playboy and I would steal his playboy. So I had very like how they stayed married for 35 years. I have no idea. Um, But I kind of had both ends of the spectrum in terms of parents who are in different ways. I don't want to say obsessed with sex because I feel like we all are. You know, it drives so much of each of us, but from a very young age, I could, I could just see how much, um, sexuality seemed to influence my parents and then working at being in that situation at Planned Parenthood, this is pre Google and being like a teenager who was just sort of starting, I would say like nowhere near really starting to explore my sexuality in, in some ways personally, but I had access to all this information and I was dealing with other kids my age who were coming in asking questions. So I kind of had to learn fast. Um, so that was my first job. And then when I was 16, I moved to New York city, um, and started going to art school there. And, I started collecting burlesque costumes at the flea market and photographing myself in them. And that led to my first book and film, Pretty Things, which is about the last generation of American burlesque queens. So that had to do with sexuality. Um, And then while I was researching that, I got into, I was really interested in um, sex work in the history of sex work and courtesans. Um, and so I wrote my second book on that. Um, so it's kind of been a, yeah, it's been it's since I was far away from Planned Parenthood, <laughs> but not really in a way like the through line in everything that I've done, whether it's like write a book or make a film or, or found the sex that is always around sexuality is around, around these issues that we tend to not talk about and that we tend to have so much shame and fear and taboo around. And again, it drives so much of our culture and, you know, being on the end now of the the sex ed and receiving so many messages every day from people all around the world who are walking around feeling like there's a certain size vulva 
that one is supposed to have, or that there's some like baseline normal that we're also supposed to ascribe to, but like who invented that normal? Well, I, I, <laughs> that's another extreme. There is a, what was always accepted as normal was, a, was a, a, a girl fulfilling certain roles and a man fulfilling certain roles. But now we have uh, the genders are sort of, uh, getting less clear. And this is where we're having issues today and what the young people are trying to work through for themselves, a new identity, as you're saying, a new normal. We still have very much a heterosexuality in, in most relationships, but then it doesn't mean that that's the only kind of relationships that we have to have. So, uh, I, you know, I, I, I almost wonder, when do we start talking about this with young people? That, that, you know, Kimmy and I were discussing that before. Do you start at four years old, at five years old, or, or do you wait till someone's in their early teens? Well, can I circle back to one thing you just said about normal? Because uh, uh, one of the- Normal, I shouldn't mean yeah. normal. I mean- No, but, but I think it's a really good point that you brought up, but because one of, one of the chapters in the new book is called the new normal. Okay. And so, and you said that today we have a new normal, but I actually feel like it goes back so far generationally. When I think of how my mother grew up or my grandmother or my great grandmother or my great grandma, I think of how many centuries of human beings have not been able to experience their full pleasure potential, have been really going through trauma, traumas that have been buried and they didn't have places to talk about. And that this idea that we've always been subscribing to some idea of normal that is um, yes, it's patriarchal. It's it's based on you know white supremacist patriarchal ideals to throw around some big words that like you know kind of scare people. But these things have stopped us from I feel truly truly living to our fullest and being joyful and and a lot of times have created situations where people feel trapped. And now we're in a situation with young with you know younger people, as you say, where people are like, let's dismantle this system. This isn't working. I'm unhappy. Because a lot of times they look at like their, their parents or their grandparents or, and they, they see things that they don't want to necessarily repeat. So in terms of how we should start talking to kids now, I think that in an age appropriate manner, we should be um, talking to kids about their bodies and naming things like naming what genitalia is that it, you know, when they start asking. And we should also alongside age appropriate sex education, be talking about self-esteem mm -hmm. and self-worth and self-love and making sure that, that people understand that these things are integral to understanding our sexuality. Because what we, by not talking to kids about it, the thing is that you start to basically put your sexual pleasure in someone else's hands. Cause by the time you're like, oh, I don't know anything about my body or how it works. So like I'm 14 and I'm gonna let some kid who doesn't know a thing himself, but his dirty unclipped fingernails inside me, you know, and I'm gonna pretend to like it, which is a backwards way. I feel, I feel like it's almost like we're, we, we get to the age where we explore and then we have to like unlearn. And yeah. Do. That's so interesting. What you, I, I completely agree with that. I know I, you do. <laughs> I know you do. I want to get back to the fact that we're trying a very small percentage of a population that has questions about their sexuality. I, I don't think so. I think it's like I the don't entire population. So. Really? Are we talking about the people who are not sure about their own sex or are we talking about sex in general? I'm, I mean, I'm not when you say that. Sex, when you say not sure about their own sex, what are you referring to? Well, you, I, you know that a lot of people now don't know how gender? to identify. Yes, themselves, and that's become very, very more sexual. Um, like um, that's become a much more current conversation. I know. In the, so I think in you're schools. saying there, so. There's confused like a lot of people when they're trying to figure out their gender right. identity or right. like what sexual preferences they have. I think that's a different. That's you can also be confused. Let's even if you're a straight woman, you can also be like, what's masturbation? Is that okay? Do what should I feel bad right, about so it? Like, I think, education. I think it's all of the above. Okay. That, all right. I, I mean, just want to clarify. I'm not sure, you know, where we're going with but this. But Liz, like, feel free to like yeah, educate in, my grandma well, on this. You can definitely because... educate me because this is a very, I mean, I, I understand about, um, you know, uh, people wanting to explore their own differing sex uh, desires in this age, and that's perfectly fine, uh, you know, but there are 
most people, and I'm going to only, I'm going to say most people, because I still believe it, are in a straight relationship and know that they're either a male or the female. But there is a large percentage of growing young people who are, who are confused. And I think that's what we have to address, the confusion. I mean, if, if you don't have um, definite roles to play, how do you learn what would make you happy? This is what I don't, I don't know. And I feel the young people today are having a terrible time with. Okay. So, well, there's a lot to unpack in what you just said, and I want to address a few parts of it. So first, like from your perspective, you feel like this is a conversation that's just happening now, or no. these kinds of questions are just happening now, but having spent a lot of time and, and I'm very interested in the history of sexuality and my, my previous two books, the last one was about sex work in the 1890s. And the one before that was burlesque going from like 1760s to, to like 1940s. So all these kinds of questions and sexuality and different roles have been around for generations. And um, like we have different nomenclature for it now. So now we say things like transgender, where back in the day we would have had different words for it. Or now we say things like non-binary, where actually one of the biggest um, stars in New York and Broadway in the 1920s and 30s was this man, Julian Eltinch, who was a crop, back then he would call a cross-dresser. There was a whole theater named after him. So these th things have existed forever. And then the other thing that you said about that you think most people subscribe to like this one model. Um, here's my question for you. If you grew up in a world where you were told from the time you were born that the choices for ice cream were chocolate and vanilla, right? And so you didn't know any other. And so even if you like, maybe sometimes were like, I'm a little bored with chocolate and vanilla. I wonder if there's like any other flavors out there or you saw someone who like was making their own ice cream and it was like bubblegum flavor and it looked kind of interesting, but just the even thought of tasting that you already had so much programming around like, no, this is what the flavors that you'll have. So I feel like now we're in a time where it's like the 31 flavors is open and it's like more than 31 flavors is like 3,001 flavors. And so I think that's the difference. I don't necessarily think that most people are in these certain kind of relationships. And also I think that most people are not necessarily happy in those kinds happiness. of relationships. Happiness is a whole other conversation. <laughs> that, that's a whole other conversation. Whether they're in a role that they've been playing for, for centuries and centuries and centuries, that's another conversation also. I think there's space for everyone. And that's what I you know, really subscribe to. And I think the schools are finally coming up with different words for, for their youngsters and, and that makes them feel more comfortable. I personally, um, you know, I got married really young. I I'm now divorced, but I was with my ex-husband for 13 years. So I was in like a very, uh, traditional. traditional relationship, very, very young. And actually I struggled a lot when I got married with all these identity questions. Cause I was like, what does this mean? Am I now a housewife? Is this what I'm supposed to do? You know, I really had all these, these things go on in my head back then. And I think people are now really just questioning these systems all over the place. I wouldn't just even take sex. You know, you could take climate or social justice. It's all over the place. We're kind of waking up and being like this. We're not happy. We're not happy in these systems. And what, where is our planet at and where is humanity at? And how can we have more truthful, you know, authentic, fulfilling lives, including sexually? You know, these conversations happen between my grandma and I a lot, and it's hard to see each other's sides on things. Do you have tips ever kind of for navigating those kind of conversations with family? I think it's really important in, in all of our conversations right now to remember to breathe and be diplomatic and practice active listening. So that means when I'm when when you're speaking, I'm really listening to what you have to say, even if it like mm -hmm. rubs me the wrong way. I'm not at, I'm not planning my rebuttal in my head, even in like a marriage or any relationship. I think that's like helpful advice <laughs> because a lot of times we just immediately we don't even actually communicate. We're not really hearing each other mm -hmm. and we're just so ready for like our comeback. With, like you're wrong. And that doesn't solve anything. And that, that's my other problem with like cancel culture or someone 
where's our, um, I think a lot of people feel like they don't know how to engage in these conversations we're having, or they don't know how to engage because we're using words that are unfamiliar, like cisgender or heteronormative or whatever. And we just expect people, hey, get out the program. You don't know what that means. You're canceled. Right. But that doesn't change anything. I think it's like you guys having these conversations with each other and trying to hear each other's point of view, that's like where magic happens. And that's what's gonna push this forward. Like in my corner of the internet, we call them super woke social justice warriors. Um, they just go off on every and anything. It, it, like for example, they get mad anytime we do content around masculinity or men. I personally love men. And I also believe that we all need to evolve as human beings. So why am I just going to, why would you say, well, you don't know this, so you can't participate in the conversation, but not offer tools for people to level up. Mm -hmm. I think we all need to spend a little more time, like having the conversations that are difficult, having conversations with people that don't agree with us because we're all like stuck in our little bubble algorithm on social media. So we only see other people's views who mirror ours, all of us. Um, you know, that's why it, even in building the sex ed, it was really important to have a diverse set of people behind the scenes building this. Mm -hmm. It's even when we were first developing it, we had a, um, someone who was working on the technical side and we, and she said, can you ask, this person was writing an essay and she said, can you ask them, how do you know if you've ever had an orgasm or what it feels like? So that's not a question that I would think to ask. What kind of stuff do you put together for those listening who don't know on your platform? We have uh, lots of essays written by experts on everything from anal sex 101 to postpartum yoga to orgasm breathing to, gosh, I mean, name it, ejaculatory disorder. Um, and then we have li a, a library uh, with books divided by every single genre, like from um, parenting resources to erotica to literature to history. Um, then we have a sexpedia, which is like a living glossary of terms to like to explain, to break down a lot of this, these words that are used now, both slang and, and, and words like um, non-binary, for example, or cisgender. Because I get a lot of um, straight, successful guys, very successful guys, like, uh, you know, well into their 40s that will ask me questions that they feel afraid to ask in public. You don't expect to talk to, to young children uh, ex the way you are talking to adults. I mean, we have to, who, do, who, who is the first initiator of this conversation? Is it the educator? This is what you were asking before. Is it the parent? Is it a doctor? How do you, if you see somebody who's clearly struggling, which, I, which is the part that bothers me the most because I had someone in my family who's clearly struggled. So if you're clearly struggling, who should be the first person that you talk to? Let's say a, a, a 10 year old uh, young man or, 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 or young lady, who would you go to first? They're not going to read your publication because they're too young. A lot of their parents will ask me to talk to them. Actually, I have a lot of like a lot. Of, I end up having a lot of kids that I, that I mentor throughout, throughout my life that ask me questions. Um, unfortunately, doctors, medical doctors are only given about eight hours of sexual intake training in medical school. Nothing. So Exactly. So they're not really equipped. And even when you go to the gynecologist, they're not asking you very many questions and they're, you're, they're inside you for like less than five minutes, you I'm know, to somebody talk. older. I'm talking about somebody young. I'm right. No, I'm saying what you're saying, but you're saying what, who should be the first person. Right. And the problem is that one should hope to find someone in their life who's willing to take on that conversation. I, hopefully it would be someone in the home because at school, there's not really great comprehensive sex education and there, it hasn't changed all that much. Maybe if you're lucky now, you'll get a little bit of consent education and um, you might, I don't think you're going to get anything around pleasure. I, I think it's going to be more about like, here's the risks associated with right. sex. Yeah. And maybe a little bit about puberty. So all of the sort of deeper emotional questions. Also, we really should be talking to kids about the tools to process pornography, because unfortunately, by the time kids are eight, that's how that's what they're seeing porn. 
and and they have no one wants to talk about it or talk to them about what they're seeing what it means you know that it's make make believe what happens behind the camera so hopefully that would be a person ideally a family member that is going for example let's say you know that your child is starting to masturbate right you what you don't want to do is shame them for it and make them feel like that's bad or dirty you know because it is natural and healthy and normal maybe you want to say like that's that's great. That's totally normal that you're, that you're doing that. And, you know, explain to them that those parts are for them to touch and not, not for other people to touch. And also that they are not, they don't get to touch other people's private parts, you know, without asking for permission. And then you may want to say, don't do it in the living room in right. front of the family like that. But you want to be careful with the tone of your voice to not make them, because those are the things that we get conditioned in an early age to feel like ashamed about that lasts well into adulthood. First of all, I don't understand why these children are allowed to watch pornography. Well, <laughs> I mean, their I parents aren't saying, here you go, they Google it. Like, what do you mean? Oh, you mean they Google it on their phone? Yeah, That's you can you just can search just on your phone. On any, uh, you can, you can yeah you i can register? right now i can go on my phone and i could search oh, Pornhub and oh, see I, a million oh, really? videos yep yeah and, and unfortunately yeah. yeah i mean that that i didn't realize i mean i thought you had to sign up for something and be no. you know an adult or so, of some sort mm -hmm. it used to be really hard to get porn and right. now it's like uh scrolling that's through that's instagram that's or ordering something on amazon um great. yeah it is bad but it's a function of our culture and where we're at. And so this idea that we're going to put it back in the box is not realistic. So what we need to do is be able to speak about it, like not only for children and teenagers, but as adults too. I mean, that is a big problem. Can they shut these porn things down? Is that well, a possibility? No. no, and I don't think you can put it back in the, in fact, the porn, the adult webmasters figured out how to monetize the internet before anyone else. And sometimes people will call me like big business people that are in the luxury fashion sector or um, technology sector. And they will actually ask me for introductions to people in the adult world who are working on pretty advanced like VR and AI, because a lot of those things will get will get developed in those spaces. And and a company like Pornhub there that what's interesting is that not only do they have uh, more viewers on a daily basis than Netflix does in like a month, but actually they have more controls in place to deal with things like revenge porn, like child pornography. They, that stuff gets taken down immediately, whereas Facebook and Instagram do not have any controls in place. So although they get sort of thrown under the bus, because that is what they do, they actually do a way better job of policing those things on their platforms than most of the platforms that we think are safe. Mm -hmm. There are plenty of porn sites or platforms out there, right, that you do know where it comes from and you do know that the like um, filmmakers or the act, I, I don't know if you call it actors, but um, yeah. that performers, performers yeah. Um, like that they sign themselves up and that they're getting paid. And like, there's, I don't know if you can maybe give our listeners any of those sites, yeah. but um, it's, I don't think we need to give the listeners those well, sites. No, because I let them read. I'd rather have them read Liz's book. <laughs> well, I think that, I think it's, I mean, I think it's good to, I think it's good to give people alternatives and, um, to, to, to porn and to also just advise to maybe just think about how you use porn. How, like, do you need porn? Do you find that you have to use porn to get off? Do you find yourself becoming emotionally numb to it or using it to escape or fill the void? Can you get off using another modality? Um, I, Erica Lust has a site called X Confessions. That's great. She's a female filmmaker who makes erotica. Um, there's Velisa is another big platform now that's that's doing that's doing ethical porn. You mentioned your Sexpedia earlier, which I love because you have things on there from abortion to 
explaining the AIDS crisis to biology terms. Um, so I wanted to go through maybe like three or four terms here um, that some of them I actually didn't even know. And then I, so I know our listeners definitely won't a lot of them. Aftercare is a really good one. If you could explain what that is, that would be great. Sure. So aftercare is something that actually is sort of a term that comes from fetish and kink communities. And it's the practice of taking care physically and emotionally of your partner or partners after any sort of intimacy takes place. And this is something that I think really should be applied to heteronormative vanilla sex, because I cannot tell you how many times I hear people complaining about, well, they didn't call me afterwards. And I feel so, you know, however, however you feel, I think it's just really polite to process together. Well, you just shared bodily fluids with someone. So I think it's really normal to check in and, and how are you feeling or, you know, in BDSM kink community where things can get a little more intense, that could include things like, can I get you some water? Do you want to cuddle? And, and the thing about aftercare is that you can discuss it because we don't discuss sex enough in advance. We think it's just supposed to mysteriously happen like in the movies. Um, is that you can discuss in advance, like, hey, I really need like, and this has nothing to do with relationship status, by the way. Yeah. So uh, for people who got like nervous, oh my God, if I ha- set expectations, they're going to think I want to like boo them up. No, it's just saying what you need after you're giving someone the honor of sharing your body with them. Yeah. So like, Hey, it would make me feel really good if we could cuddle for like 20 minutes after this. And that person could say, cuddling makes me really nervous. Could we do this instead? So you kind of have a discussion about what your needs are and how to meet them. And that's just totally normal. That doesn't mean you have to have a relationship with them. So you're so right in that that is implied sometimes. Cause I think if I was like, want to cuddle, the guy would be like, are you obsessed with me? Like, do you want to be like, do you think I'm your boyfriend? Um, like I, I or at least maybe they don't oh, think that, nice. but it would be nice after you're having sex with somebody to have some kind of relationship. It's just, unless it's just the, like you say, a hookup. I mean, if you're having sex with somebody, you should have a relationship. It shouldn't be just just having sex with everybody every single night. Well, it depends what you partner. want, I think, All right. but I, regardless I, of what you want, sometimes I think there is like a implied thing that you think if you're cuddling, if you're not automatically putting your clothes back on and being chill that emotions come into play but it it, I guess it doesn't necessarily have to be that well what does that mean being chill so you're basically pretending to be cool and that you don't have feelings and that you didn't experience an intense situation with someone and are the oxytocin is flowing and which is a bonding chemical so I think that that's like all this facade of what we're pretending to be is just like Oh, you can't really let go and really enjoy yourself and let your freak flag fly if you're pretending to be chill. And yeah. then you're going to like get into your head about it afterwards, or you're going to, that's where the self-esteem and self-worth mm-hmm. education that I think is so integral comes in because you saying, I'd really like to cuddle. Definitely. You can even be explicit. I'm not looking to be your woman you know, at all. Like you're not even that you don't, you don't want to say like, you're not even my type, but you know what I mean? You can can make it clear. This is what this is. But in these, in this moment, in this hour or whatever it is, like agreed upon time, I just want to feel your body. Let's do one more, like a fun, maybe zaddy. What do you think Zaddy is? Kimberly, you lost me. You lost me on on the sex. So you you just got to keep talking to Liz. I, I I'm exhausted. No, no. Okay. <laughs> we can we don't want to exhaust you. I don't want to exhaust you. I mean, it would. I'm working myself up to have sex with one guy and have a relationship for 58 years. If I had to worry about all this stuff, it would be a disaster. Okay. So okay. Let me ask you something. How do you keep it? How do you keep it spicy and fresh? Well, we're married 58 years. It hasn't been fresh in years. <laughs> so the thing is, you you end up liking somebody. You love someone in the beginning. You like somebody as you get older. It's not the same sex that you had in your 20s when you're in your 80s, but it could still be a nice thing. Uh, it's like the cuddling all of a sudden becomes very relevant. Um, 
uh, it's, you know, the porn maybe was great when you were 20, 25 and you were trying new things, which I remember th th that we did watch, but I don't think I'd watch porn when I was in my eighties. I don't really care about the same thing. So I think keeping it fresh, you're just being yourself. You've loved each other. You know, understand one another and you have history H to me that that is very, very important in keeping a relationship and you have fun. You can still laugh at the same stupid jokes or a new joke, um, but it's more applicable to your age. And there's nothing wrong with that. Um, I, I, I think it's different things at different times in your life and uh, growing up together, having a love affair, having a family or not a family. Um, all these things keep you uh, in touch with somebody. And that's why so many people get divorced. 50% of the population doesn't stay together. So um, how did I keep it together? I think I had to laugh at a lot of stuff I didn't think was funny. Uh, and I did. And you know what? It paid off because he laughed at my jokes. So yeah, I think intimacy and developing those bonds with someone is really important. But what I think is interesting is that people think that like sex, you can just coast on it. Whereas we put time and discipline into our lives with things like exercise or like our health, or well, let's say we're learning an instrument or a sport or whatever, we can block time out. But I get so many people that are just like, well, we've been married however many years and we don't really have any sex or, and, and sex also doesn't need to mean like penetration. Right. It doesn't need to include right. an orgasm because they don't take time to make sure that that's actually something that's con like, con there's consistently working on. Like I have to tell a lot of people who are super busy schedule, send an iCal reminder like for even makeouts. Like you have to make time in your life you have to actually work on your sex life. It doesn't just, and you're totally right. You are an evolving sexual being from the time you come onto this planet until you leave it. And I know lots of people in their eighties who are having like super wild sex, actually. Now, I have to tell you, we were at a dinner party last <laughs> week. I'm gonna tell you this completely off the thing. Some, they're all 80 year olds. So it's not anybody that's your age or Kimberly's age. And now they're talking about the new secret to Viagra is they have to have it with lime juice. I mean, oh my was, God. So now everybody, do you ever see 10 men all writing in their, in their, on their phones, get lime juice the next day. So it never does end. Uh, you're absolutely right. Viagra needs to like tell their marketing that team was in, or something. That was in the <laughs> Oh, it was. It, no. Oh yeah. Evidently it made the headlines. That's so funny. Lime juice and Viagra for anyone over that needs a little help. So we would love to end the episode with a game we play with all of our guests. It's a quick um, round of Grandma Gail's old fashioned dating quiz. I don't think Liz is going to like this game. Really? No. Well, let's okay. see. So would you rather receive a call or a text from your partner? A call. Would you sleep with someone on the first date? I slept with my ex-husband the first night I met him and I was, but that was my, my roommate at the time. Like she open the door in the morning to the bedroom she was like oh my god because she was so shocked because that is so out of character for me mm -hmm. um so yeah it's not usual because I'm I'm pretty monogamous mm -hmm. um like I, I'm pretty I am pretty traditional yeah. actually yeah <laughs> um dating apps or setups I've never done a dating app right okay yeah. um Move in together before getting engaged or, or after? Getting married a second time. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm not sure. I would probably say move in. The second time, yeah, I move in with someone before. Mm -hmm. Okay. And um, should one person pay for the date or should you alternate? Oh, gosh. I mean, this is going to totally paint me as the 1950s housewife that I see. Really am. <laughs> but I mean, I, I do love in um, because in my professional life, I am so independent. I kind of like be, I really like being taken care of. But that said, I l also love to like spoil someone. And I think it's nice to buy people like, you know, yeah. But I have always been with alpha men who are like, well, let me take care of that. Honey. Right. Okay. So three out of five traditional. So a little bit split, but more on the traditional side. What are you modern? I'm modern and she's traditional. Well, you know, I'm traditional. <laughs> it's not even a conversation there. <laughs> 
but I am an old soul in a lot of ways. So I'm kind of yeah, you still yeah. you still believe in love. Yeah, well, I can believe in love and be modern. Oh, I don't. I know. hope that we all believe in love. I don't know. I think people are getting so mean lately. Uh, I'm not so sure they're getting very narcissist types of personalities, and they're all about themselves. And I really think if you love somebody, you have to really be in there 50 50. And that's something I think a lot of young people don't understand. It cannot be one sided. You really have to both love each other and work at taking care of one another that that would be a, a, a an answer for me and nothing is nothing is ever perfect but sex should be good <laughs> sex should be good and you should take care of somebody uh and love one, one another and respect them because if you don't love is a choice them. also yeah. love is a choice yeah. and you do have to work yeah. for it, it doesn't That's just right. happen and That's we right. all grew up at least you know I did, and a lot of young women I know grew up with this like Disney myth. Of, yeah, that's a big problem. Someday your prince will come, and then you happily live ever after. And that's just not the way it works. You have to accept someone and love someone for where where they're at. You can't change them. Right. Nobody changes. We've discussed this. If you don't like yeah. it in the beginning, it's only going to get worse as as people get older. Yeah. Well, Liz, I loved this conversation so much. Tell our listeners how they can find you and the sex ed. Sure. Well, you can follow us on Instagram at the sex ed and I'm on Instagram at Goldilocks G. I believe I've been kicked off a couple of times, but I think this account is Goldilocks G or you can look up Liz Goldwyn. Our website is the sex ed.com and you can stream our podcast, the sex ed anywhere where you listen to podcasts. And your new book, Liz? The My new book, Sex, Health, and Consciousness, comes out this fall. I'm going to even so read it. Good. <laughs> I hope that you like it. I'll give you my report when it comes out. Hope you guys enjoyed the episode with Liz Goldwyn. Um, it's always something to think about and something that we should think about more seriously and talk to our uh, younger grandchildren or children uh, w about. And, um, you know, we're trying to uh, keep you all informed. So uh, if you like this type of episode, please let us know and uh, we will have more of it. Our 1950s movie of the week. It has been a while. We're doing Where the Boys Are, which was one of my favorites. It was 1960, and um, that's where Connie Francis's iconic song, Where the Boys Are, was first in. And basically, it's about four college girls, but they have, uh, in the beginning of the movie, they do a class kind of about sexual education. Obviously, they didn't, they weren't that open about it, and they had more narrow ideas. But it was interesting to see how those conversations have changed within the classroom. Okay, you guys know how to follow us on TikTok and Instagram at Excuse My Grandma. Rate us five stars wherever you're listening, and we will see you next week. Bye.